Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Enrique Osurto, and I'm one of the panels and researchers that collaborate here at the Autism Research Coalition. Uh, today, we have the great, great honor uh, to welcome Dr. Kristen Bachner. Uh, Dr. Bachner, thank you very much for joining us today. The honor is mine, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for those that may not know uh, Dr. Bachner, I would like to just read a brief introduction to his very extensive uh, background. Uh, Dr. Bachner is a researcher and he's also uh, an autism dad himself. Uh, he is the medical director of, of the Oxford Recovery Center in Brighton and in Troy, Michigan, uh, where he strives really to bring forth cutting edge therapeutic options for his patients. Uh, he has lectured in national, nationally and internationally on autism spectrum disorders, as well as in, in clinical applications of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, his goal really is to is to always optimize each each affected patient, uh, you know, and, and his path or her path to recovery. Um, and you know, he, he is he's an OBGYN by training, if if I if I understand correctly. And he has received the you know recently a, a, a certificate in plant based nutrition from Cornell University. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, Dr. Bogner is going to discuss the autism recovery through synergy, the arts program, which is a very comprehensive program that he. Um, that he developed uh, along with uh, some other experts. And, and, you know, it's also a holistic approach to uncover uh, subtle anormalities uh, and, and address genetic signaling and biomedical, uh, bi biochemical pathways in autism, which, you know, unless it is, you know, accurately addressed, it could, it could lead to all kinds of issues. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Borgner, uh, please take it away. Oh, well, um, as you know, uh, autism, is a growing problem. Um, I think the last time we, we presented this and we had some more updated numbers, but it was something like every year in the United States, we fill a nice European uh, football or you call it soccer stadium with about 88,000 people of new cases of autism. Uh, so it's a big problem, um, not only for the patient, of course, but for the families and uh, the economic burden uh, and it's a pretty big problem. So that's what I'm worried about, um, you know, every day, all day, uh, deep until the night. We research this and we're trying to uh, help these patients, help the parents uh, find the best solution for their children. Because uh, as, as you know, I have a 16 year old now affected with autism. And uh, how can I rest if I don't look for answers for him to get his life better and, and so that's what we all do that's what you do that's what thousands of other parents do and i'm just a parent researcher no different than anyone else and uh, we have a big center here in michigan uh, where we have several treatment modalities uh, one of them our core is utilizing uh, hyperbaric oxygen technology which is you know, one of those chambers you've seen before you go in it and there's 100% oxygen where you apply pressure and expose the body to hyperoxic states, meaning a lot of oxygen deep into the tissues for various benefits. And then we have, like you mentioned, other modalities. We do a lot of genetic testing, neurotransmitter testing, lab testing. We have a big uh, ABA program, uh, which is more holistically oriented. Uh, our ABA director, Casey Diskin, she was she was trained in Australia, and uh, it's a very unique approach. Um, in that regards, we have physical therapy, OT, speech, uh, neurofeedback, which is very interesting. I'm just uh, really diving into that. It's, it's fascinating, uh, really. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we just, within the last year, just got in contact with our local university here with the research director. We're engaging in research. We're planning to uh, push out several papers. Um, one of them is a white paper I'm working on, but uh, some other papers uh, we just uh, started writing. Um, so it's exciting. It's an exciting field. It's, as you know, autism is, there's no silver bullet as far as I know. And it's very complex. Everyone is different. We all know that. And, uh, you know, I don't know where to start with that. Uh, you know, I don't know if you have any particular questions or if your audience has any questions, but um, uh, it's it's uh, it's a big uh, it's a big topic. So, 
Yeah, I, I guess I, you know, I, I think so, something I would like to say to the audience is that I, you know, I've, um, I've watched several of your videos online and I, I've been like, like, you know, honestly impressed by the level of understanding that you have on, uh, you know, the uh, dynamics of the um, autism etiology from, from a molecular perspective and the genetic signaling and uh, the biochemical pathway. So, uh, you know, please, um, Feel free to uh, you know uh, lead us in in any any way that that you feel is it would be helpful for us to understand you know the the root cause of autism and and how you how you treat it in your in your clinic. Well, you know I I used to be in a different practice and uh, like you mentioned OBGYN and I used to see thirty patients a day and um, at the end of the day I was mentally exhausted really because uh, you know you spend literally fifteen minutes with a patient. And uh, you barely get to know them and you still have to do your physical exam, write their prescriptions. And then in the maybe seven minutes that you talk to the patient, you think you have it all figured out for them. But in reality, you're just treating them like you treated your last patient with that condition and there's no different. And so the, the real core differences really lay in the genetics. You know, what makes you and me different uh, is our genetics. Now, everyone is different, except of course, you know, identical twins but even them you know they have different epigenetic influences from the outside um, but uh, when i started to look into the genetics about four years ago and started counseling patients along with this you know we do snip analysis and for those of you who don't know we don't look to see if there's one gene that causes autism no it's we're looking at your genes that we all have and we just simply see if you we you know that particular patient has weaker copies of those genes um, and that, that's called a SNP. It's a single, single letter on the gene. You know, a gene, remember, has up to uh, 100,000 letters that makes up a gene. You know, there are various sizes. What does a gene do? It codes for a protein, protein like an enzyme. Most genes code for enzymes. But you can, you know, make all kinds of uh, things, structural proteins, messenger molecules, hormones. That's all transcribed from a gene and you know genes are like our computers are made of ones and zeros genes are made out of four numbers or four letters a g c and t and and so we have base pairs on both sides that make up the dna and what we're looking at um, is to see if in, in the whole long sequence of a gene let's say mthfr a lot of people know about mthfr there is um you know, on the position 677, for example, there's a substitution of a, of a, instead of a G, there's a C. And what that means is simply that, well, the gene is still there. There's just one letter that's different. It's what we call the variation, the single nucleotide polymorphism, the SNP. And what happens now is that the gene still is making the enzyme. But the enzyme is now folded a little bit different three-dimensionally, and it's not working as good as the original copy. And so, because, for example, with MTHFR, you know, we have always one gene from mom and the same gene from dad. And so then we look, did one of my parents give me one of those variation copies, the weaker copy? So maybe did both parents give me that? And if that happens, let's say both parents, you know, gave me or both of my parents gave me a weaker copy, that means I have two weak copies now. So it could be worse off than either of my parents. And we call that a homozygous, homozygous variation, which means while well, I have two weak copies, it doesn't mean the gene doesn't work. It just means that the end product works about 70% less than the original copy. Uh, or if one parent gave me a good copy, one parent gave me a weaker copy, then it's about 30% in total reduction of what that uh, enzyme can do. And as you know, enzymes change things. You know, for example, uh, to say it very you know, primitively, it, for example, uh, uh, MTHFR, uh, saying what, it, what does it do from the core? It changes folic acid into the active form of uh, folate, which is methylfolate. So it change, enzymes change things, and that's what's required in the body. And so if you have a problem with MTHFR, for example, well, you make much less methylfolate. And that's a very important 
active form of uh, vitamin B9 that's required in a process we call methylation. And, you know, methylation has various functions in the body, uh, but, you know, detoxification, DNA repair, things like that, um, but especially energy transfer. And, you know, we need a lot of energy for certain genes, especially in the brain. And um, that's where some of this energy is transferred to that some of these genes get activated in the brain to do certain things. And, and in this case, with autism, we're very interested in the metabolism of neurotransmitters. Um, and so we combine our genetic testing with neurotransmitters. And that's where it becomes very interesting in, in the autism world. Because, you know, I've been, I was, my son is 16. And, you know, the moment he got diagnosed at night, I remember I was, I was up all night just reading, what, what is autism? You know, what did we know? And man, I, I stood up often all night and printing, 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 and reading, reading, you know, one door opens 10 more doors. And then uh, really started to understand that I really don't know anything. So over the last 10 years, you know, studied the GI system, the liver, uh, you know, autoimmune, pens, pandas, uh, parasites, you know, all the treatment regimens that you can think of that you probably uh, know as well. And, you know, finally got to the brain and to the complexity of the brain, um, started, started to tackle that, integrated the genetics and, and oh man, I had no idea uh, what we would be finding is absolutely mind blowing in, in my opinion. Um, and applied these you know, findings to our patients here in the clinic. And I have to say for the first time, we're really starting to treat patients where we have more good outcomes than you know, no change. You know, that's always, uh, it doesn't work for my son, doesn't work for my son. Well, at this point, I think we're helping more patients than not. And that's, you know, when you speak about recovery, you know, we're not speaking about, hey, your kid is recovered, ready to go to college. You know, it's not like a finger snip, oh, you wake up and what happened kind of thing. You know, recovery, if you get, if you were in good shape and let's say you get hit by a bus and you're badly injured, we can try to get you to the point where you were before, but you probably will never get there to be in the same physical shape if you've broken all of your bones and all that. But we can help you to recover, to get as close to that as possible. And so that's what we're doing. I'm not claiming to cure, so to say, autism, but I can give you the best potential, at least that's what we're thinking, the best potential based on your genetics to, to uh, recover to whatever the limit is you know, um, possible. But um, yeah, with autism, it's uh, very interesting uh, in regards to uh, what happens. And uh, I think uh, the core uh, uh, is based on um, one central mechanism and that is uh, toxicity and deficiency. Uh, the toxicity, in my opinion, is driven by uh, aluminum and the other is a deficiency. And that's either enzymes, genetic deficiency to cope with that, uh, which leads to inflammation, uh, which is prevention of inflammation and also reduction of existing inflammation. You know, all of that is driven by genes uh, that there's a problem there and especially with adrenaline. So in my opinion, uh, the central mechanism for autism is based on adrenaline. Um, adrenaline problems uh, and adrenaline, you know, from high levels of adrenaline, a lot of problems arise and uh, a lot of interesting things are happening. So, uh, but yeah, that's basically um, what I'm interested in, um, working with some great people, communicating with some great people. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure how deep you want to go into this. Yeah, so if we can just step back for a second, um, I found there is a there is a concept that that I, I've heard you talk about, which is which is really th these these things that you know when we talk about autism, I mean the term itself doesn't tell us anything, um, and that autism fundamentally is encephalitis. Um, so so I think that it would be helpful uh, before we dive into the. The, the, the biochemical pathways and, and the genetic signaling, um, where does this inflammation come from, uh, from your perspective? Uh, that's a good question. Well, I think, uh, you know, if, 
you, you know, I could show you my computer here, but maybe I do. Look, this is nowadays how computers look, right? This big. But I have it hooked up to two monitors. And it's a tiny little box. They used to be big, right? But let's say on this tiny thing, on my two monitors here, I open 10 programs. And those are very, you know, graphic design programs. So something that really sucks the energy out of your CPU. Now, if I open all of these programs and work hard on them, what will happen? That little box will heat up, right? And will start to heat up and get really hot. Or uh, a different uh, example, if I have a very powerful car out there, well, it's a very powerful engine, but if I beat on it too much on the expressway, the engine gets too hot, right? So it doesn't matter how good the engine is gonna get too hot. And so what I'm thinking with autism is that the thing with autism is that these children are not stupid. In fact, I think the opposite. I think these children have two powerful brains and the brain is hyperactivated. The brain is hyperactivated and the uh, advantage of a system or of a condition like this is that um, you have much greater insight into everything, into vision, you have more visual uh, accuracy and uh, even visions. Uh, and in general, your mental capacity is beyond anything that we can imagine, um, even though it doesn't appear that way in a lot of uh, people. But basically, um, you know, in regards to the term autism, it doesn't mean anything. And you mentioned it's encephalitis. Well, it's encephalitis for several reasons. You know, if you, if you have a powerful car engine and you don't put any oil in it, well, the machines are going to rub against each other and they become very hot. If you hyperactivate your brain, well, that's good, but that needs a lot of energy, a lot of sugar, a lot of, you know, uh, metabolism, a lot of ketones, a lot of uh, energy, a lot of oxygen, especially. So if you act hyperactivate these brains, but if you don't provide that fuel for it, it will overheat and you become inflamed, uh, just like anything else. And when you have inflammation, you have restricted blood flow. And when you have restricted blood flow, then you have problems you can maybe understand, but depending on which area you have to restrict the blood flow, you have deficits, such as speech. A lot of children that we have here that understand everything just can't speak because there's a hypoxic uh, area that has been neglected, so that needs to be trained. But the bottom line is in regards to autism. Remember, autism first was described uh, uh, very early on in the 1940s uh, uh, as a symptom of schizophrenia. And, uh, you know, schizophrenia was well known during those times. And uh, they thought a subgroup of those schizophrenic patients, especially young children, uh, they called them uh, autistic. Uh, and so it didn't occur, you know, then of course, Canard came out and he described autism uh, a little bit further, but it wasn't really until 1980 until the, uh, the DSM uh, uh, separated uh, schizophrenia from autism. And if you look at it, it was a uh, DSM-3, you know, now we have version five already, but in version three, they first separated infantile autism from schizophrenia. And the justification was that, while well, the difference is that schizophrenic patients hallucinate and have delusions, whereas, Patients with autism don't. But think about this. How would they know that? How would they know that children with autism don't hallucinate and have delusions? Because the average age of a child being diagnosed at that time was about 33 months. But as you know, the majority of children don't speak. And so how would we know that these children at this young age don't hallucinate? Um, and so the reality is, they separated them both out because one is adult, one is a child. It's different diagnostic criteria for both of them and probably different therapeutic approaches. Um, you know, one of them is self-reported schizophrenia. Wasn't schizophrenic before, all of a sudden I see things. And, uh, you know, whereas autism, it's a diagnosis of the observer only. The child doesn't tell you anything. You can just see the clinical symptoms. And so those were separated in the 1980s, yet, there are huge biological and genetic parallels. And the reason that is important is 
because uh, you know we know a lot about schizophrenia, receptor systems, therapeutic approaches, and so forth. Um, but most importantly is that if you look at the MRI of a child with autism early on, there's nothing wrong. No radiologist in the world could tell you that, you know, the brain of a child with autism looks, oh, this is, you know, autism on the MRI. You don't, you don't know that um, because they look perfectly fine. So it has to be the chemistry um, within uh, the brain. You know, later we know frontal lobes inflamed, you know, there's uh, evidence of encephalitis and inflammation, sure. But why is that happening? Why, you know, is it, is it a chemical? Is it inflammation? Uh, why? I claim it is, again, hyperactivity of these areas with deficient adequate nutrient supplies. But more importantly, uh, what's going on is, is the question. And how does the adrenaline come into that? Um, so, uh, you know, if, what is the best way to start this? Um, if you look at adrenaline, so, you know, I'm writing a white paper right now with, with Wayne State here. And when I did my research to write some of the uh, paragraphs uh, in that white paper, um, did some research and I found five papers that demonstrated that children with autism have higher levels of adrenaline. Uh, and I kind of already knew that because for the last three years, you know, we do genetic testing. And like I said, we combine it that with neurotransmitter testing. And I see that. I see that, that something doesn't make sense with the adrenaline. You know, start seeing these patterns with these children. Um, and you know, if you look at a child with autism uh, clinically, you can tell. You know, these children are all over the place. They don't stop moving around. They can hardly sit still. <clears throat> they don't pay attention. They look like they have hyperactivity, uh, ADHD. Um, and, uh, you know, at times, oftentimes we see children that are very aggressive, have self-injurious behaviors. Um, they constantly uh, crave sweets. Uh, they are selected for only certain foods. Um, they, at times, hold their ears, even if there's no sounds uh, around. They're hypersensitive to sounds, too, though. Um, and, you know, they're flapping their arms, they spin in a circle, their behavior is just very bizarre. Um, and, and so the question is, what is happening in their brains that would elicit such behavior? Is it just random? Is it brain damage? Uh, you know, is it a, a developmental problem like the CDC makes us believe? Um, and nothing like that, nothing of those, in my opinion, is true. Um, what is happening is that, you know, like in my case with my son, you know, he was saying words, he was behaving fine, he was smiling, uh, and all of a sudden something happened. And like thousands of other parents, uh, you know, when you, for example, look at the history of, uh, what's his name from England? Uh, I'm blanking on his name, Wakefield. Wakefield, you know, he was a uh, expert on measles, you know, in England, and he was in a, in a, you know, had his department. And there were so many parents in England that, you know, the children received the MMR shot and they were like, well, you know, this looks like a measles infection of the brain. So they went to the hospital together, knocked on his door and said, what the heck, you know, you're the measles expert, help us out. You know, and then you know what happened afterwards with the study and he lost his license and he was scrutinized and, and so forth. Um, but something happened. And, you know, I see that here too. I see hundreds of parents uh, with children with autism. And I would tell you, most of the majority would say that something happened with these vaccines. Either my kid had a fever or, you know, then they were giving their children Tylenol. And then within a certain time frame, it was not like it was there before. And you slipped into a world and you basically lost your child, uh, you know, in, in the abyss of whatever, uh, lost speech, behavior, and autism. And so what is it with the vaccines? And we'll get to that, but, you know, just remember that, you know, we get 
what, about 72 vaccines uh, now by the age of 18, um, when 1980, it was much less than that. Um, within the first year, we get 24 vaccines. In 1980, it was eight. So it's three times more. Um, uh, and, you know, it's, it's going to be even more uh, in the future. But autism really started exploding in the 1990s. And that's the time, you know, um, we had MMR, we had MMR boosters, you know, second doses. And, you know, Deicher is a researcher that always showed that after MMR, we had these spikes happening in every country that introduced them. Uh, and even after the booster of MMR, it went up. But anyway, so aluminum, keep that in mind. How is that involved? You know, what happens with aluminum? What does it do in the brain? Um, and why do some children, why are they affected and others are not affected? So all of these questions took a long time to answer, but uh, I think we're, we're there, uh, really. Um, and what happens is really fascinating. Because what is happening is that, you know, when you look at the brain um, and you look at adrenaline, for example, you know, there is a gene that breaks down adrenaline. It's, call, it's called catecholamine methyltransferase, C-O-M-T. And... Um, this particular gene breaks down adrenaline. It also breaks down dopamine, but dopamine has other genes and or enzymes that can break it down. But adrenaline mainly has COMT. So, you know, let's say we have problems with COMT. So what happens then if your adrenaline will go up and there are several things that raise your adrenaline levels, you know, obviously stress, but then also uh, sugar and chemicals. And we can talk about how these three influence uh, adrenaline production. Stress, we know, is direct. Adrenal medulla uh, secretes, uh, you know, it actually starts in the brain where you have uh, uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, which leads to, you know, from the hypothalamus, goes to the pituitary, which is uh, ACTH. ACTH goes into the plasma, goes to the medulla, and then adrenaline is released from the uh, adrenal gland and acts peripherally to elevate your heart rate, uh, dilate your pupils, you know, uh, open up your lungs for one purpose, to counteract the danger, you know, as we all know, adrenaline is fight or flight. And, you know, it's um, the one purpose of adrenaline is, is, is either to fight or to run away, right, from the danger. And so what happens uh, in the body is that the adrenaline shifts the blood flow to the muscles. And one thing it does is shifts the blood flow away from the gastrointestinal system. Because if you, if you get chased by a bear, you don't need to digest your food. It's not the priority right now. And so what happens is that you have less blood flow to the gut. So there's one problem that starts with the gut. Uh, but additionally, you know, and you know, these are meant to be fight or flight situations for every now and then in your life when you need it. But imagine you're permanently in that state where you have high adrenaline and you have problems breaking it down um, because you're constantly feeding it with sugar, you're constantly feeding it with chemicals and with histamine and, and so forth. And so when you're permanently in that state, you not only restrict the blood flow to your gut, but you also change your immune response. And as we know, um, uh, you know, when adrenaline is chronically elevated, we also release cortisol because cortisol is our stress hormone. Um, in fact, when, uh, when uh, adrenaline gets released from the adrenal medulla, it uh, also uh, stimulates the adrenal gland to release cortisol. And so cortisol is important because cortisol, uh, the stress hormone, uh, is, you know, it's a steroid hormone. Uh, you know, if you give a child, let's say a newborn child, you give them a steroid shot, and a lot of these new, for example, premature babies that get born, they get steroid shots uh, and, you know, to mature their lungs quicker. But one of the side effects of that is that these newborns get thrush, right? They have uh, a white tongue, thrush, which is a uh, fungus, you know, candida growing in their mouths after steroid shot. And so 
basically what happens if, if you're, in, you're basically immunosuppressed. Your Th1 helper cells uh, are suppressed because of uh, cortisol, which means you're more susceptible to yeast and mold and also viruses, but not so much for bacteria because your Th2 response is actually enhanced. And so that's in my opinion why you don't see these children sick a lot, you know, with fevers and bacterial infections. Um, but up to 94% of children, interestingly, with autism have gastrointestinal issues. So why is that? Well, we said for one, you have less blood flow to the gut if you're in a fight or flight situation chronically. And number two, your immune system doesn't fight off, you know, mold or yeast very well. So of course you have up to 95, 94% of children with autism with gut issues. It's not really a primary problem. And that's why studies like in Arizona that perform stool transplants, it's great. You know, I think all of these children with Adams, I think he had 16, all of them did better, no doubt. But guess what? All of them required more stool transplants after about six months. So you know it's not your silver bullet. It's great to help these children, of course. Uh, would I do it? Yeah, uh, perhaps. Uh, but um, they needed more. So there's an outside source that causes that. And in my opinion, again, it's adrenaline. Now, to go back to that, that, that would explain a lot of the gut issues. But what else happens with adrenaline? A couple of things. So one of them is, well, adrenaline releases in an acute situation a lot of glucose, right? Uh, it, it wants to make energy available for your muscles to preemptively be ready to fight or run away. Your body knows there's a dangerous situation. You're going to do one or the other. You're going to get the heck out or you're going to fight. Because that's a very, um, you know, innate response. Thousands of years ago, we used to sleep outside. We always need to be on high alert, uh, right? Um, and and so that's why we have adrenaline. But the one thing that happens is when you release that much sugar for the muscles, and let's say you don't run away or fight, well, all of the sugar is going to be available. And what happens in response is that insulin goes up. Insulin levels rise with high blood sugar. And there's nothing wrong with the pancreas of an autistic uh, person. Why would there be? And so what happens is the insulin tells the sugar to go back into the cells. And what happens now is that, you know, if you have a certain threshold of blood sugar where your body alerts you, hey, you better go eat something because we need sugar to survive, right? The brain constantly needs sugar, even more when we sleep. But um, if you have high blood sugar and insulin kicks in, your blood sugar drops and you reach a certain point, your uh, body is telling you, you better go get something to eat quick. Something sweet is better because then we start back from scratch, right? But the insulin drops the blood sugar chronically in these children. And so you reach a point, uh, you get very hungry. And if you don't eat, then what happens in order to prevent a hypoglycemic shock, the body releases more adrenaline. It releases, it releases more adrenaline to release more sugar. And that's why you become angry and hungry. You become hangry, right? You know that term. And, uh, and hence you either eat and make up for it. And that's why these kids mostly like sweet foods or you don't, but then you become pretty angry. Um, and so that's how that cycle is going that chronically feeds more adrenaline production. Now, there are two other things that raise adrenaline, and you know, one we said is stress, sure. But the third one uh, is really interesting because that has to do with chemical. And so, as you know, most chemicals that we consume uh, or we get in touch with is what we put in our mouths, right? And let's say you eat something very processed, a lot of chemicals in it. Well, it enters your GI system. You know, an adult GI system is about 20 feet long. Uh, everything gets digested, you know, the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, and also the chemicals. And everything gets absorbed. And the first organ that gets everything is the liver. And in the liver, you know, the liver is saying, hey, we need to filter out the good from the bad. We need to grab all the chemicals before they enter the bloodstream. And the, the, chemo the molecule that we produce that is very powerful to grab these chemicals is glutathione. And that's why 70% of glutathione is uh, made within the GI tract and the liver. 
Most of the rest in the lungs because the air is very toxic. We need a lot of glutathione in the lungs, um, but also the brain, kidneys, and so forth. But in the liver, you know, and that's what we see on our genetic test is that a lot of these children have problems with the production of glutathione. Um, one of the reasons is methylation problems. That's one, you know, MTHFR and MTRR, MTR. Um, but also more closely related production problems of glutathione. You know, we talk about genes like CDS, GSTP, GPX, and the SOD genes. Um, so it is well known in the literature, we don't need to talk too much about glutathione. It's well known in the literature that the glutathione levels in autism uh, is very much uh, decreased. So that's a known fact. We don't need to uh, talk about that. But what does that mean? So that means that, you know, if the chemicals are coming into the liver and we have little glutathione, well, we're gonna grab some, but most of them will start entering the bloodstream, right? And then what happens to the chemicals? Well, there are two ways where they can go. We can either go towards the kidneys and pee them out, or we can store them in the fat cells. And it just happens that, you know, with the about 30,000 chemicals that are registered with the EPA, uh, most of them are very negatively charged. Uh, synthetic chemicals usually have a very negative charge to them. So that means they have a lot of electrons in their orbit. And that makes them lipophilic, meaning when they enter the bloodstream, they're more likely to dissolve in our fat, you know, and our brain is fat. They, they, they settle in our fat cells and in the bones. Um, and they're not water soluble. So we can't really pee them out very easily. The only way we can pee out those chemicals is if we make them more positively charged. And the only way to do that is by stealing electrons from the chemicals. And the way we do that is with oxygen. Oxygen bounces off the chemical, grabbing an electron, making this more positively charged, you pee out the chemical. That's great. But that comes to the expense of now having created what we call a free radical, superoxide. It's oxygen with an extra electron. And what happens now is that this is uh, uh, a free radical because you know it freely is looking around to find another electron because it's electrically not stable. Um, and it wants to get another electron to be electrically neutral. And it get, grabs that electron, unfortunately, not from another chemical, but from our tissues, from our brain, bones, everywhere, joints. And free radicals just start to oxidize us, causing inflammation. So, um, so that's one thing with the chemicals. But the other thing that happens now is that whenever the chemicals enter our blood from the liver, histamine goes up. And that's a very, very important uh, mechanism, histamine. Uh, you know, just like, uh, you know, for example, you get stung by a bee or you eat a peanut. And let's say you're one of those unlucky individuals that has massive amounts of histamine released, you know, because your blood got in contact with a foreign antigen. Uh, a lot of people hyperreact and a lot of histamine is released. Now, as you know, histamine dilates your blood vessels. And if you release too much of it, then, um, you know, you have hives and all of that uh, itching. But in extreme cases, you have anaphylaxis. When the histamine dilates your blood vessels, your heart can't make up for it. You have hypovolemic shock, um, and oh, hypogenic shock. And you go to the ER, and what do you get to save your life? You get a shot of adrenaline, right? To burn the histamine and your blood vessels go back to normal, your blood pressure restores and you survive. But what happens when chemicals enter your blood from the liver because you had too little glutathione is your histamine goes up. And when your histamine goes up, you naturally uh, stimulate adrenaline release and it's a defense, it's a survival mechanism again. And then we are also looking not only at that, you know, with the glutathione that would prevent that, but what about the genes that break down histamine? You know, DAO and HNMT. What are these genes doing in you? Do you have problems with those? Because if you do, then histamine is even higher and sticking around longer and an exposure and would even stimulate more adrenaline release. So that's how that works. That's why we have to, uh, in the liver, talk about detoxification to see where the problem is. Is there a production problem? Um, you know, do you have a problem with prevention of inflammation? Or you know, once the free radicals have formed, you know, the superoxide, we have genes that um, 
reduce those free radicals to water. You know, first it's superoxide, then it's hydrogen peroxide, then it's H2O. And this is all driven by genes, but the last step to go from hydrogen peroxide to water also requires glutathione again. So you can see if you don't have glutathione in the liver, you're chronically inflamed and you stick around with that for the rest of eternity. And that's why autism, you know, you can have an initial insult that pushes you into an inflammatory state and you don't snap out of it because you don't have the things to do it. You don't have the nutritional uh, way to get out of that. And um, uh, yeah, so free radicals, very important. So now we have an excess of free radicals, you know, uh, a mold and dysbiotic gastrointestinal system, which causes leaky gut, which causes even more chemicals into the liver and causes huge amounts of oxidative stress in the body, huge amounts of free radicals. I think Richard Fry from uh, Arizona, you know, he's a pediatric neurologist at the university there, great, great research. Um, he, in one of his papers, showed that there are 74 papers that he found which indicated that autism is a state of oxidative stress. So again, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. Great people have found out about this. But how do you tie it all together? Why is Jimmy autistic and Johnny is not when they receive the same vaccines, the same diet? And again, this has to do with the genes that break down adrenaline. So let's talk about that. What, what are the effects of that? Well, the, the effect that we haven't talked about is the effect that adrenaline has on sleep. So we know very well that there are studies that show that children with autism have very uh, disturbed circadian rhythms. They don't sleep very well. We know that their melatonin is, uh, you know, has been demonstrated is too little. Um, but uh, what consequences does this have? Well, this is where uh, it gets really interesting. So as you know, you know, sleep is very important. We hear that all the time. You get your sleep, it's, it's healthy, it's unhealthy not to sleep. Well, as you know, there are five stages of sleep. And, you know, uh, stage five, the deepest sleep is where we dream. And, you know, and, and that state, we, you know, where most of our, what we call REM sleep happens, uh, you know, rapid eye movements, uh, which is our dream world, right? We, we look around and it looks to the observer like your eyes are moving. So it's basically like every night when you dream, uh, if you dream, you actually, in a way, you are hallucinating because you're in a state, you don't know that you're dreaming. There are things happening uh, that, you know, are not real. So it's, you can think of it as a, uh, you know, hallucinating. And so the problem is that if you are in a state of high adrenaline, um, you suppress uh, melatonin and, uh, you know, because you want to take a nap or you want to get tired when you get chased by a bear. No, uh, it's not time to take a nap or to go to sleep. So melatonin obviously is suppressed. There are other reasons why there's low melatonin and autism. One of them is a deficiency of vitamin C in the brain because vitamin C converts dopamine to noradrenaline. And out of all things, noradrenaline is uh, a precursor for melatonin production. And I see on our neurotransmitter test that because these children are so inflamed in their gut and livers that there's little to no vitamin C ever reaching the brain. You know, when, when we used to do the organic acid test from Great Plains, and we check people, uh, you know, that I do not do that test anymore. I don't think it's very helpful. But um, we saw basically everyone, their level of vitamin C, unless you really supplement hardcore, is close to zero, zero point something, when the range should have been, you know, between 10 and 200, let's say. But um, so if you don't have vitamin C, you have high dopamine, low noradrenaline. And, you know, you need to, you need to have a balance. If you have high dopamine and it doesn't, transform into noradrenaline, you have no focus, no attention, you, um, you have no planning, no executive function, and you don't produce melatonin. And high dopamine states, well, your brain is on fire. You're constantly thinking, constantly have thoughts in your head, and you can't relax. And so that is a problem. Even though it creates high intelligence, you definitely have ADHD, anxiety, and things like that. And so, uh, low melatonin. So what does that mean? Low melatonin means that 
your body cannot really get to the stage five. It cannot relax enough to get into that deep sleep. You only can get into the deep sleep if you're completely relaxed. And, um, you know, with high adrenaline, that just doesn't happen. You're considered a light sleeper. Um, and you can sleep still, but, you know, it's somewhere between stage one and four, but you don't reach stage five really good. And that is, uh, that is one of the core things uh, with autism, because think about it. What makes you dream? You know, uh, is there a chemical involved with it? And there appears to be. The molecule that makes you dream is called DMT, dimethyltryptamine. It's, uh, uh, it's a uh, hallucinogen. So it's, it's a psychedelic. Uh, you know, some people go to the rainforest in Brazil to drink ayahuasca. You know, if anybody's ever heard of that. Ayahuasca is a mixture of two plants that they mix. One plant containing DMT, the other one containing the enzyme uh, no, the compound that inhibits the breakdown of DMT. So you consume it, and what happens? You have extremely powerful visions, and you basically leave your body, you're detached from your body, and you see colors, and you know, you're somewhere else in a different world, in a dream world. And so that's what they found when they infused DMT or when somebody consumes high doses of it, or there was Rick Strassman in New Mexico in, in, who intravenously infused it into volunteers. You know, they all had similar experiences. Boom, you take off like a rocket, uh, you lose complete control, and you're just taken on a journey through the universe. Um, so that's supposed to happen when we dream that little molecule you know we don't have the high concentrations like an iv but we still actually university of michigan here and you know university in our state here found that humans produce dmt the physiologic function is poorly understood but it's clear that because it is also generated in the pineal gland like melatonin it certainly is involved with dreaming um just because we have that evidence of you know, exogenously infusing it, very similar states. But let's say every night, you know, uh, let's say for you, Enrique, let's say I, for three nights in a row, I would sit on your bedside with a machine and I would see when you're about to enter stage five sleep. And just before that happens, I would press the red button and you get shocked and you wake up and I say, hey, wake up, you cannot dream. And let's say I would do that for three nights in a row. On night four, I let you sleep as long as you want. And that night, your, your brain would make up for the three nights that you didn't dream. And you would have a very intense dream. That's how important dreaming is. The question is, what happens when we dream? First of all, the mystical question that I don't have the answer for, when we dream, is it something generated within our brain? Or are we tapping into a different frequency? Because, I mean, let's face it, we see things we have never seen before in our lives, right? We see scenarios, objects that we've never seen before. So is it a synthesis of different things that our brain makes up? Uh, I don't know. Or are we tapping into a more collective human consciousness? I don't know. Very uh, interesting stuff, though. Now, um, what's important is that we don't have that. If you don't dream, you don't have that. What happens during REM sleep physiologically? What happens is a process we call memory reconciliation. And that's a process, as you can, you know, if you're techie with computers on Windows, it's like a defragmentation of our brain. You know, you organize. For example, uh, all of the experiences that you had throughout the day, there's a lot of information, right? And the brain processes that information. And most of it, some estimate up to 80% of all the information from the day, your brain erases, presses the delete button. And about 20% we imprint into our long-term memory. And that's how we organize uh, information and process information and create memory. The problem is if you don't have that stage, then all of these little bits and pieces that happen, they stick around still. And if you do that day after day, you have a cesspool of information and you don't know where you are anymore. And the thing is, because we don't release the DMT uh, at night to dream. Um, and it you know, applies to adults too. Many people don't dream anymore because the water is fluorinated and calcifies the pineal gland. But in these children, if you don't release the DMT at night because you didn't reach stage five, that DMT starts to build up 
in the brain. Um, and you know, that's what I'm trying to write my paper on is that what happens then is that the DMT comes out throughout the day in your wakeful state. You know, if I, on the other hand, for example, would let's say be a really mean guy and I take you hostage and I say, hey, you cannot go to sleep and I would keep you up. You could probably hold up for about what, four or five days or maybe, maybe less, maybe more. Uh, but somewhere in that ballpark, but what would happen before you would collapse would be that you possibly start to hallucinate. You start to hallucinate and see things and then you would pass out and you couldn't hold it together anymore. Um, but that's what I'm talking about is that if you don't release that molecule throughout the night, there's a phenomenon we call REM rebound where the dream state starts to infiltrate the wakeful state. And that's very interesting because um, we know that if we, for example, um, you and me talking right now, when we measure the frequency of our brain, the frequency that our brain is in tune with, and I say that very, uh, very consciously, that we are in tune with, because is it that you and me right now, we have alpha and beta frequencies that rule our brain uh, in synchrony, right? But is it that our brain produces this frequency or is our brain simply chemically modulated to be on that frequency? Are we tapping into that frequency or are we generating it? And it doesn't matter if we need to answer that question today or not, but we know that if I would give you, for example, uh, LSD or psilocybin, which are magic mushroom, or MDMA, uh, which are all structurally very similar to the DMT molecule that I was talking about, because they all come from one precursor called tryptamine. You know, tryptamine produces serotonin, it produces DMT, psilocybin, LSD, MDMA. All of these are structurally similar because they all work on the serotonin system on serotonin receptors. Remember, we have 14 different serotonin receptors and there's one called 5H2A and that's the receptor, serotonin receptor that makes us hallucinate. That has been proven uh, very well before. But, you know, when uh, we have now uh, the wakeful state and we have this excess DMT in our brain um, and it comes out, well, then, these serotonin receptors get stimulated. And that's, that's the uh, crazy thing about the neurotransmitters. You know, and you've heard about dopamine, adrenaline, serotonin, glutamate, glycine, all of these are neurotransmitters. But think about serotonin, not as a neurotransmitter that goes from neuron to neuron and activating neurons that do that. That's glutamate, for example, that does that. In a sense, also dopamine. But think of uh, serotonin more as a modulator of certain brain networks, of certain brain regions. So for example, uh, serotonin uh, activates your vision center or your prefrontal cortex, especially, um, you know, uh, serotonin. And so it basically, it can modulate the activity of certain brain regions. Uh, it can hyper uh, activate them or it can hypoactivate them. It's like a uh, serotonin, you have to see like a maestro. It coordinates the orchestra. Some instruments at this point need to be a little louder. Some of them need to be a little bit more quiet. And that's how you start to see how these children are different because they have different abilities all of a sudden. You know, one high functioning can play the piano at an early age and so forth because you hyperactivate certain areas. And that's what serotonin is rather than a, a modulator of individual neurons, it activates brain regions. And so it just happens that, for example, they have found LSD, you know, it's a very powerful 5H2A uh, modulator. And what they found is that if the receptor starts to take LSD in, it traps the LSD in the receptor. And that's why there's a very strong uh, permanent activation of those systems. You know, LSD, like you are uh, having, these experiences for four to six hours, uh, approximately. And, you know, for example, DMT, if somebody consumes DMT, people smoke it or get an IV, it lasts a minute. The difference is 
that, for example, DMT gets very quickly metabolized um, and it doesn't have the same affinity for that receptor, even though they're all structurally similar. But anyway, so you have these uh, excess uh, psychotropic uh, molecules released throughout the day and that's literally putting these children into different uh, uh, realities. They are having a different perception of the reality uh, and, you know, they behave accordingly. You know, if, if I would give you LSD right now, you would behave different than you do right now. You know, you would move different, you would speak different, you would behave different, um, you know, and we know that because uh, of the experiments that they had. Um, now to further show you that what I'm saying um, is, you know, not just all made up, we have plenty of evidence uh, in the literature, at least suggesting that this route is the route that is responsible for autism. Um, you know, one of the DMT molecules that I mentioned to you, uh, derivatives, very similar uh, in nature, is called bufotenin. It's, you know, in the chemical name, it's DMT as well. It's just, they call it bufotenin. And bufotenin uh, is very, very strong psychedelic as well. And they have found it in the urine of ASD patients in 1979 and 1972. Uh, and they even found elevations of bufotenin in the parents of autistic children in 1975. So, uh, Furthermore, um, in 1995, they, do, they did it again, and they found elevations of bufotenin in 32 out of 47 autistic patients, and in all 18 patients who had uh, mental disabilities, uh, where it was only found in two out of 200 normal typical patients. And then the la latest paper was out of Italy in 2010 that also showed elevations of bufotenin, this DMT derivative in the urine of autistic patients. So how does this happen? You know, why does this happen in these children? And, you know, the, the ultimate question always is why, is, why are there more boys affected than girls? In fact, to about four to one ratio, just like in coincidentally the same ratio as in schizophrenia. Um, but the reason is that I told you what, what builds DMT, this molecule, is tryptamine. Tryptamine, like I said, also produces serotonin, sure. But um, the problem is that MAO, monoamine oxidase, that gene breaks down serotonin. And so when you, um, when you realize that MAO is an X-linked gene, meaning it's only on the X chromosome, you realize that, well, boys only have one of those genes. So if you have a SNP in that gene, you're pretty bad off. In addition, what stimulates that gene is vitamin B2. And if you cannot activate vitamin B2 because of a genetic problem, our genetic test tests for that, then in addition, not only have a bad gene, but the chemical that stimulates the gene to go to work in the first place is missing as well. And then what happens? Well, then serotonin doesn't get broken down. And then, well, what happens? Usually tryptamine, gets broken down by MAO as well. Well, MAO is not working, let's say, tryptamine is very high. And that's when the uh, tryptamine gets converted to uh, bufotenin or DMT. And, and, and that's why you have to have several genetic SNPs available for all of this to perfectly play out. But here's the thing, not every autistic child has an MAO variation, right? That would mean every autistic child does. It does not. I do have a study that shows statistically significant elevations of MAO concerns, but what inhibits MAO? Aluminum. Aluminum inhibits MAO. And uh, there's very strong uh, evidence of that. And uh, I, I have the appropriate studies that prove that. And so think about it. Aluminum in a patient that cannot detoxify properly, that cannot activate the immune system or the glutathione to bind it because you don't have glutathione, um, what happens? The white blood cells in your uh, body will come in. They will chew them up 
Again, they don't have glutathione, they're not processed within the white blood cell, and then they get transported to the brain. Now, when they get transported to the brain and get uh, deposited there, and we have evidence of that, I mean, just look at Chris Exley from the United Kingdom, who showed that the highest amounts he's ever seen in autopsies of measured aluminum wasn't Alzheimer's, was autism. And, you know, thinking about that, we get about, what is it, uh, 5,000 micrograms uh, of aluminum uh, within the first several years of life knowing that aluminum is cleared by the kidneys and a child's kidney is not developed until the age of two. I mean, there's so much evidence of aluminum being a culprit and being neurotoxic. Uh, no matter what the pro-vax people say that this is the wrong information, come on, just, just look, you know, look at aluminum. It's, it's there, it's in the brain. How can you refute this? It's a neurotoxin, uh, period. And so we know now that this inhibits MAO, which means tryptamine, and DMT are not being broken down. And it's even more likely that because of the aluminum, you start to release DMT. And what's the big consequence of that? Well, think about it. Children with, uh, or you and me, again, we operate most likely, or most uh, people uh, do is alpha and beta frequencies in our brain. When we sleep, sure, if we dream, we have theta and delta frequencies. When we uh, have our uh, EEG here, we call it uh, neurofeedback. You know, we put on a cap with 19 leads on your brain and we measure the frequencies and the predominant frequency of the brain, autistic children have theta and delta frequencies. Well, how weird is that? We usually see that in somebody that's sleeping. And so there's your evidence that they must be hallucinating or at least in a different frequency state where the only explanation is that state can only be induced by a psychedelic or inflammation. Um, we call it a high entropic state, um, high entropy, um, which means you can have such powerful abilities that you can jump into different quantum uh, states of consciousness. You can, uh, you're very flexible in that regard. It's in, in, in fact, the complete polar opposite of depression where you're only stuck in one uh, little state and nothing can really get you out of it unless you fix, fix it chemically. But um, you know, that's why in depression, we always talk about in a monotone gray scale, it's very you know, one-sided. With this is the complete opposite. You have very different, uh, abilities to jump into different scenarios. Uh, you basically, you know, small little thought, you can open it up, go inside, experience it, and do that with a whole different other uh, ideas and visions that you have. So that is the, uh, you know, psychedelic state, the delta and the dream state, basically. And interestingly, not only do we see that on our autistic children, and there's papers written with autism that they have higher delta and theta with, but also, studies that show when you infuse DMT or, you know, into someone or you have, or you measure the brain activity of someone who consumed, you know, magic mushrooms, for example, uh, psilocybin, they also have theta and delta waves, even when you're awake. And, uh, and there we go. So the bottom line is, what I'm trying to tell you is that I believe autism is our children, uh, basically hallucinating. They are in different altered realities, some more, some less. The more DMT you have, the more severe your autism. Um, and, uh, you know, high functioning autism is basically you're not as severe, you can still function in reality and not that high on your psychedelic concentration. Um, and, you know, for example, that's what, what comes, uh, you know, into, into the scene right now in the, in, in the medical world is psychedelics. Uh, psychedelics become more and more legal, more and more lax on how we look at them. Uh, I think Oregon and California now have them legal. I think in certain, in, is it Denver that it's legal there too? It's certain cities, um, you know, and here we have a city in Ann Arbor where the police is not pursuing uh, psychedelics anymore. Um, and so it's becoming more and more accepted, uh, but mostly in the in world what we call microdosing where you don't have psychedelic effects, but you do have, you know, there's some evidence that it's uh, 
excellent choice for people with PTSD or treatment refractory depression and so forth. And so I'm not saying that this is the worst thing that could happen, you know, because in a sense, if you, if you accept this hypothesis, then it's very reversible. It's very reversible and it's not a permanent state. And it's not that there's nothing going on in their brains. In fact, we don't know. And oftentimes, I mean, we have kids here that beat themselves in the head all that we get them like that. And then we start treating them. And after several months, we see them work on the iPad faster than you can move your eyes. These are very intelligent human beings. Um, it's just that if I would take a mega dose of LSD, I would probably be doing that too and screaming and woo, you know, have all of these symptoms of an. Uh, the autistic behavior because who knows what they're seeing you know maybe they have monsters that they see and believe me i have my share of high functioning autistic children that do verbalize what they what they experience and you know nobody ever asks them do you see things do you hear things they all do they all do uh, it's 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 pretty fascinating and you know most of the hallucinations that we see for example in schizophrenia they are auditory up to 80% of hallucinations are auditory, visual as well, but guess what? There's also hallucinations of your sense of smell. There's hallucinations of your sense of taste. And so why do these children have these aversions to food? You know, we don't know, you know, they're eating a piece of meat. Maybe for them, it's, they're eating, I don't know, that cat, you know, we don't know uh, how gross this is for them. We can't blame them because maybe they have taste hallucinations. Um, but that's what I think uh, that uh, there's different uh, uh, altered realities for these children. And uh, the approach would be simple is not, not simple, but would be logical would be to block the formation of adrenaline, which is reduction of sugar, which is reduction of chemicals. So dietary changes and the ability to grab these chemicals in the liver, boost glutathione production, and less stress, of course. Uh, fix your histamine genes, you know, fix your, uh, go on a low histamine diet if you, if you have these issues with the histamine, um, avoid aluminum. Um, and, you know, uh, if, if you're on a state like this, eventually you might even want to consider blocking adrenaline. Um, but because of that, you know, we do a lot of, you know, newer, newer things right now is, you know, treatment of mold. You know, over all these years, the adrenaline has caused a lot of mold overgrowth in the gut. So we, we treat that as well, uh, oftentimes with um, the appropriate medication. Um, and so it can take a while, but if you know what you're fighting against, it's much easier than just blindly giving, oh, vitamin B12 shots and, and things like that, just randomly trying what works. You can lose a lot of time. I certainly did. And, and so that's where we're at. Uh, sorry, it was a long explanation, but it's... Um, it's pretty uh, fascinating uh, with the frequencies, I think, uh, that what is the bigger purpose of this? You know, I don't know. I suspect there's something much bigger than we can imagine, which is, uh, I think of as a, you know, if you think of us as humanity, uh, we're only a sand corn on a big, you know, beach of existence on this planet. This planet is 4.5 billion years old we are just a fraction of that on this planet. And um, we're just one organism experiencing this planet. And I believe that there is a global uh, human consciousness. We are a species that's experiencing the realm of this planet. And uh, I believe that autism is simply the condition in which we tap into this global human consciousness um, for whatever purpose, but I believe uh, that that's the case, that we're in a dream state. And maybe as someone that takes advantage of that sort of insight, uh, remote viewing or things like that, I don't know, but uh, it's certainly bigger than we can imagine, I, I think. And there's a purpose. It's, in my opinion, it is engineered. They want us to be pumped with aluminum and these chemicals for a specific reason, either mind control, submission, whatever it is, but it's not good. And all I can say is we continue to work to, to eradicate autism with all of our power. So. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Um, so, uh, you know, what I, what I really like about your, your explanation regarding aluminum is that it would really help to explain a lot of the underlying causes 
that you know we seem to have treatments for, but it's really not a a full blown treatment, right? Like for example, you you mentioned the case of um, you know fecal transplants. Right. Uh, you know they do help to some extent, but they don't seem to you know completely eradicate the issue. So it, there's got to be like an, an an underlying reason why these uh, you know, lack of uh, bacteria species, that, which has been demonstrated, uh, you know, up to 25%, I believe it is the number of, of you know, fewer bacterial species in, in autism than in typical kids uh, has, have been found, and, and there's got to be a reason for it. Uh, so, so I think that this is, this is I mean, th this idea that, that adrenaline is really implicated uh, y with all the epigenetic, um, you know, causes that you, that you mentioned, uh, could be a great explanation. So, so I guess just to just to circle back on the treatment aspect of this, uh, how, how do you treat this? I mean, are there so two things? Are there any general recommendations that we can that we can give our viewers? And then and then on the other hand, is it always personalized? Is it always do we always have to go to the to the level of detail to understand these these genetic pathways and these biochemical uh, pathways and neurotransmitters in order to really uh, you know uh, be able to to help uh, these these children um, w w with this treatment. Yes, I, I say yes uh, strongly um, because there are many other receptor systems that you know if you if you lack certain nutrients are imbalanced uh, depending you know on what your genetic makeup is. Um, for example, if 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 I have a child and we check the neurotransmitters and um, the the patient has low levels of glycine. You know, glycine is a neurotransmitter, but it's implicated in schizophrenia and it's implicated in sleep disturbances, especially REM sleep disturbances. So obviously we wanna give this child some glycine, but if this child has too much glycine and you know, glycine is part of the production blocks for glutathione and you know, let's say you're missing uh, cysteine, which is the only essential amino acid to build glutathione. Well then obviously glycine is not being used and you tend to have higher levels. But high levels of glycine that are too much, you can have cognitive processing problems. So how would I know to give this child, you know, with too high glycine requiring alpha lipoic acid versus low levels of glycine needs glycine. And so it is very customized and these little differences make the difference at the end, uh, I believe. Uh, and, you know, I don't know, do you have glutathione problems with the production of glutathione? Do you have problems with CBS, you know, which liberates the cysteine from homocysteine, but then sometimes this gene can work too fast. And if you stimulate it, you produce even more cysteine, which produces more sulfur in the gut. And if you have problems with sulfur metabolism, then the sulfur kills your good microbe bacteria. And, you know, you can produce too much ammonia and actually cause brain damage and can have seizures, you know, for, for example. So we need to look at those things. Do you have sulfur problems? Do you need to avoid sulfur foods? You know, uh, eggs, cabbage, uh, broccoli. I would tell your child with autism not to eat broccoli. I mean, who would have thought of that? But, you know, you need to avoid high sulfur in some patients. You need to avoid high histamine. All of that can only be done with testing. That's why everyone is different. Does your child need a low histamine diet or not? Um, and, you know, so we already have so many food restrictions, you know, sugar, dairy we all we don't even test for it we just say no gluten no dairy and no sugar but well, now you add no sulfur no histamine well then all of a sudden what are you going to eat uh so we we're trying to be you know as clinical as possible based on evidence that we have not because it worked for somebody else because that's the mistake i made you know when my son i took him to our university the guy just injected him with B12. He didn't even shake my hand, you know, the doctor. And I was like, yeah, whatever. It works for other kids, but it completely didn't work for my son. And now mm -hmm. I know why. Uh, yeah, so th I think that, that you know, that simple, well, it, it sounds simple, but it's uh, obviously, you know, fairly complicated. That, that really answers a lot of the questions that we're getting. Like, for example, do, do you recommend liquoborin? Uh, you know, what do you think about, you know, certain, certain, um, uh, protocols uh, like the like the, like the Walsh protocol, um, you know, I, I guess you know to your point, it, it really is a you know on a case by case basis. What would be the approach? I mean, there's really not a silver bullet in general for for these children. Um, would that be a fair thing to say? Well, the first thing is uh, you know you want to give your body what it needs. Like again, why did Johnny become autistic? 
and Jimmy did not. Well, Jimmy probably had a better detox system, you know, and he probably had more nutrients available than, than Johnny. And so just first of all, the first thing is to replenish the nutrients that our body is working with. Because any deficiency creates disease. We know that. Vitamin C causes scurvy. You can die. Vitamin B1 causes beriberi. You can die. Niacin deficiency killed 100,000 Americans in the early 1900s because of pellagra. If you're missing a vitamin, you create inflammation. Inflammation creates disease. And, and so first order is always just give your body what it needs. No magic root from Peru or camel, baby camel, milk or whatever. We need to give it what it needs and avoid adding more toxins you know that goes more after the gerson therapy if you know the gerson therapy she there he always said there's two things that you have to worry about in human disease deficiency and toxicity and once you figure those things out already you're already on the right path but then of course you know there are other things that you need to catch up with well years of toxins so do you need to do chelation uh very carefully i rarely do it but we do it um what about uh you know, eradication of excessive mold in the gut. You're going to have a hard time just adding vitamin C or vitamin B2 to get rid of that. You know, you need pharmaceutical intervention. What if your behavior is so bad that you don't have the ability to get these things into your child? You have other issues. You need to first calm them down. And so there are pharmaceuticals that can do that. Uh, I don't really want to promote any pharmaceutical treatments, you know, of course, speak to your doctor, don't do anything that I say here. This is just, you know, the general uh, ideas, but, you know, things that can help block adrenaline, you know, and there's amazing evidence that, for example, uh, beta blockers can help, you know, block the effects of adrenaline. And in the United Kingdom, for example, uh, Propanolol is approved for anxiety. Why would a beta blocker be approved for anxiety? It's bizarre, isn't it? Um, or, uh, you know, and, and anyway, so there are things that can be done even from the pharmaceutical standpoint, but uh, at the beginning, it's always first, let's see what happens if we replenish the right nutrition based on your child's roadblocks in the genetics. What do they need? And then let's let that play out for a while. Uh, but in general, I know that these children need much more vitamin C, high, high doses, um, just to decrease the dopamine and let them focus a little better. Uh, so vitamin C is never a bad choice, in my opinion. Uh, you will see loose stools, you know, lots of gas, all of that at the beginning, but that's because, you know, vitamin C is a huge carrier of electrons and it's very toxic to bacteria. So you will have loose stools, and, you know, that will pass usually. Um, uh, but we go up with the dose steadily with high doses of vitamin C until it reaches your brain and you've cleaned out your gut. Um, but yeah, I'm not a big fan of probiotics or, you know, these, God, you can go to conferences about gut health and microbiome and should it be Prevotella or Lactobacillus reuteri, all of that I've done. And, and, you know, many people had success with it. I just did not with my child or with my patients, uh, it's not the solution, including the stool transplant, in my opinion. Like you said, it'll come back. If you don't fix the underlying cause that caused it, they will always come back. And, and so, yeah, I mean, the problem remains aluminum, excess chemicals, lack of nutrients, genetic SNPs, and uh, it needs to be all looked at and put into perspective together. Um, but yeah, there, I don't have all the answers. I don't have a silver bullet for you. I continue to research. Hopefully one day it's just one drug and here we go. You have your child back. And until then we need to keep working. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I realize that we're way over uh, Dr. Bogner and, and I do appreciate your time like tremendously. Um, I, I really, um, I gotta say, I mean, it, it is, uh, it is very refreshing to see someone like yourself with, with such a deep knowledge of, on these matters to look at this uh, from a very honest perspective, um, you know, very unbiased. I, 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 I've known you for a little bit, and I, I know that you are coming to these things, you know, um, uh, you know, with a with a perspective and, and really with a researcher's perspective. Um, and and I, I would just like to to you know ask you. I mean, if, before we before we go, if we could, if you could provide some examples of success stories in your practice that you could reference. Uh, obviously, bearing in mind any conf confidentiality, uh, you know, things of course, but 
uh, any any you know success stories that you could reference uh, that have improved yeah. their their autism by following some of these methods? So the biggest success I have with high functioning autism, um, just because I like to empower these these patients, uh, basically tell them, listen, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, you are just too smart. And when they hear it, they like that. You know, you can basically tell them, hey, you have an ability. It's a gift, but we need to teach you how to use that gift. And the whole perspective of how they cooperate with you is completely different. So I like to work with them. Um, I have some great success with that. These children could barely tell. And then they start just to be like super smart. You start talking to them like, whoa, you're how old? And you know all this, you know, I mean, we have kids here that are 12 that I'm treating that start talking about deep politics, you know, and what happened with the elections. Like, whoa, you're 12 years old. Um, it remains to be a challenge, of course, with severe autism, nonverbal, violent uh, autism. But, you know, the great success that we have recently is, you know, after doing this now with patients on a daily basis in my fourth year now doing this, you know, I was in a different practice before that. But I would, for the first time, say that we have more success even with the severe than with, you know, not having success with it. And what I mean by success is going in the right direction from, you know, like we have a, for example, a 14 year old boy here, he came to us in the, you know, we have an ABA program and um, he came to us very violent. You know, our behavioral techs had to wear these extended gloves to not get bitten and scratched, you know, both sides and um, often requiring two technicians to take care of them. And they're mostly all day on the floor, you know, trying to get them, uh, calm. Uh, and that boy, um, you know, we uh, treated him for mold and we treated him for high adrenaline. And of course, all of these genetic uh, SNPs replenished with the right nutrients. And he is now, I, I wish I could show you pictures, but obviously I can't because of HIPAA, but um, I'm very close contact with the, with the mom. And this child now is just such a beautiful child. You know, you see the facial expression that he's just as having joy instead of fear in his face. And he can use the iPad quicker than I can move my eyes. It's absolutely fascinating how he speaks on the iPad. So it's just a question of time until we will get him transitioned. You know, he hasn't even done our main thing, which is hyperbaric oxygen, you know, which is we haven't talked about it much, but this is our core thing. You know, it's very powerful technology to reduce inflammation. And in fact, we're gonna, uh, we're right now, are gonna be the first center, uh, I think, in the, in the world that is going to utilize neurofeedback within the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, uh, basically with modulating and training the brain while under the influence of 800% more oxygen. And we can do that neurofeedback you know, with the magnets that, that come with it, they call the Tesla magnets in the neurofeedback system. It's, it's really, really uh, uh, fascinating stuff. But this child is on its way to recovery. I mean, he's sleeping. He is not self-injurious anymore. Those are huge things for the parents, just for the parents to sleep, just for the parents not to see that child beat himself up, having bruises, you know, or uh, bite marks on the hand. Uh, those are the most severe cases, and I'm just, it's such a beautiful thing to witness that, and, and to see it in the parents, they come to you, and they, they almost have tears in their eyes, and they're like, thank you so much, you know, we, and then you hear the technicians and say, oh my god, that was the best day ever, and you hear that, and it's just, nothing is more beautiful in life than to see that you help these hopeless, that nobody wants to take care of these children, they just want to medicate them with hardcore medication, they, they lay like this all day, you know, um, um, and so we're on the progress of seeing where it takes us uh, with those. We have others in the same age. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, triplets uh, that are all autistic and each one of them is doing the same as this uh, boy, uh, just calm words coming out now. Uh, you know, <laughs> we have one of my coworkers here on the desk that's more open, everybody always walks by and he came by and said, hey, Jeff. And we're like, well, first of all, he speaks. Second of all, how does he know your name? Uh, and then third of all, how polite of him to stop and say it organically from himself, you know? And uh, nobody would have imagined that this child would ever do that. He's been to the universe, two different universities, IVIG, all the, you know, 
uh, treatments and and, and here we go here is, uh, after this. Um, and so maybe these are not the most impressive examples, but I can tell you, I wouldn't do this if I wouldn't have success. I wouldn't be satisfied. And I'm very satisfied right now in the direction this is going, because finally I know what I need to work against, or at least I believe so. Um, but uh, it all makes sense to me. Um, and I'm continuing to explore the, those realms that these children are simply dreaming. I know it sounds very silly, but they're just not in our reality. We need to bring them back. And we're going to find the, the switch that does that. Amen. Amen. No, no, no doubt. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I mean, we we will really appreciate you. Uh, we know we uh, just just for people to know that I know that it's, it's, a, it's a you know little known fact that you were in the fight in the state of Michigan to get uh, the um, medical marijuana approved. Uh, you're obviously a warrior. You're 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 an honest man. Um, right. you've, you've been doing a lot of research. Um, and and you know you're giving hope to a lot of families out there. So I, I really and want I to, get, to thank you on behalf of. I get hope from guys like you. You know, I'm just a parent. I learn my most not from the literature but from parents. Just listening. Mm. How do your genes, the genetic findings that I have from my test, how, but what symptoms do you have? And then you start to correlate those two. And so the, without parents, you know, we're all in the same boat. I'm no different than you. Uh, and I could be wrong. So I admit it. I'm humble. I'm not Mr. Know-it-all. I learn somebody has something. I'm the first one. What is it? What, did, what worked for you? I don't want any fame. Uh, I don't want to be here, to be honest. I want to do something else, but we cannot until we have this figured out. We need to save our children. They deserve it. Something happened to them, nefarious or not, uh, we need to fix it. Nothing else matters, nothing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, well, we all came into this kicking and screaming, uh, that's for sure. And, but it's, uh, it's really, uh, personally, my life duty, and, and I'm, I'm sure that for you it's the same, uh, to find the, you know, the, the formula, um, if not the cure, uh, for, for our children. We will find it. We will. And if we don't, at least we tried, right? Amen. Thank you so much, doctor. I mean, thank you for your time. We, we really thank appreciate you. you. And please look at the comments on, on the, on the interview. There's a lot of, a lot of love for you. Uh, oh, that's so nice. People that really appreciate I love you. all of you too. It's all about love. Thank you so I much. Know. Thank you. No, uh, thank you for all you do, my friend. We talk soon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye. Okay.